Christ on him. And uh, what I like about him is, come to Hebrews chapter number three. You don't have to stand. Hebrews chapter three is the first thing he did was picked up the phone and called and sent me an email. And he said, preacher, I'm not sure. Uh, this looks like an open door. It looks like a great opportunity. The first thing I want to do is, is what do we know about them doctrinally? Where do they stand when it comes to the King James Bible? He did all of the research and the stuff that was uh, necessary to do that. And where do you feel like the lines are drawn and where can I go and how far can I go? Was very careful not to just jump headlong into something because um, he is called to preach and he did pastor for quite some time. And, and uh, so long story short is the Lord seems to be moving him in that direction in a very meaningful way, but a very certain way. And it don't feel like it's uh, haphazard. He's not just kind of jumping on it and trying it out. I feel like the Lord's hands on him and God's already using him. And has already begun to open up doors to be able to do things. And he's old enough to have enough sense to know how to go in and to preach when he's preaching to people that are in there that are, have chaplains who are not our stripe. And uh, some of you won't understand that, but those chaplains are, uh, uh, many of them are just there to make their eight and hit the gate. Some of them are there to get their retirement. And to be able to go in there without compromise and preach the gospel and to see people saved, whether you're able to minister to them after that or not, at least you can pull one like a brand plucked from a burning uh, out of the fire, not trying to turn them into a church member, but just trying to get them saved. And so I'm glad for what God's doing in Brother Dan's life. I appreciate his patience as much with me as what he says is mine with him. But um, he's very, very kind. He's been a real benefit to us. He's just kind of quietly done his way. And now he's down here on the floor among regular people instead of in the nosebleeds. <laughs> But I, he's now like a BB in a box car. I can't keep him situated because he's been being right over here and now he's over here. So I, is it cooler over here, sis? Is that what it is, the air conditioner? Oh, is this the balcony people? You know, now that I'm looking at you, you're a click. That's balcony people. Oh my goodness, we need to bust you up. <laughs> wow, yeah, see? It's Brother Sonny, you back there? Don't you tell me your wife took you back there. Mm-hmm, okay. I, they're all pointing at Isaiah. <laughs> Don't you be pointing at Monique. Uh-uh, no, mm -mm. You, can, you can climb up another tree with that cat. Mm -mm. No, you're not going to point at Monique, not, in him, not her and Michael. All right, what a blessing to be here tonight and a blessing to be in church tonight. Appreciate your prayers very much. Thank you for that testimony, Brother Dan. We're talking about having a sound mind and the mind and the day and time in which you live. It's real easy to get uh, bees in your bonnet, bats in the belfry, as they say. It's real easy to get twisted up, get your mind on the wrong kinds of things. And what I explained to you this morning and what I explained to you on Wednesday night was having the time to anchor yourself in the truth. The Lord is the anchor of those things. That's why it's imperative for you to know the Bible. And it's imperative for you to know who in the Bible that you're supposed to follow. So Paul says this in the book of Hebrews, chapter number three, as I told you in 1 Thessalonians, you hold fast that which is good. And I told you that in uh, Titus chapter number one, you hold fast to the faithful word. And then I showed you that in the last days, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears because why they turn away from the truth and are turned unto fables. And I explained to you this morning that being turned unto fable, the fable is nothing more than an individual taking things and making stuff up in and of themselves. They'll even take the Bible and turn it into whatever they want. The Bible later on shows you and Peter how they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. They use the Bible to say and make it say what they want it to say instead of what it actually says rightly divided. And what that does is, is it interrupts the pillar and ground of the truth, which is where the church is. It interrupts your security. It interrupts your foundation. It puts a crack there to where it makes you unstable. And then the next thing you know, when hard times come and difficult times, you turn to the Bible and say, well, does it really say that? And does it really mean that? So I'm going to show you with the help of the Lord here, just a few more verses about things that you have to hold fast to. In the last days, I'm telling you, there's going to be a resurgence where they're going to try to take that Bible out of your lap. 
They're not going to go at it the way the scholars went at it. They're not going to go at it and say a better rendering would be, the Hebrew and the Greek would be, and the Aramaic and the Chaldean it should be. A transliteration of that word ought to be, the trilateral root word of that Hebrew word should be, the Strong's number is this, the Young's number is that. It won't be that way. You've gotten too smart for them with scholarship. What they'll do is they'll get up here and they'll baffle you with words and interchange things in their conversation with you. And if you don't have a Bible in your lap, you won't even know that they've changed the passages and now all of a sudden they're placating how you want to think and how you want to feel about it. And it'll make you feel so good that you'll think, well, that must be the Bible and they must be preaching what the Bible says when in fact they're not preaching what the Bible says, they're fooling you. And if you don't think Bible-believing churches are at the top of the heap of what the devil would like to attack, you're badly mistaken. The Bible-believing churches are the, one of the few places that are still holding on to the truth of the King James Bible. You're an odd lot. You're a strange group of individuals. You're unusual because you believe in the authority of the Word of God. The problem is authority, always has been authority. The problem was the devil didn't like God telling him what to do, didn't like how God said that it ought to be done. The devil said, I think it ought to be done my way, and I'm going to do it my way. And he continues to think that. For you to think that the devil's going to repent is foolish. You say, why? Because the devil believes he's right, even though he knows what's written in the book. He doubts what the book says. Now, if you get into a position where you doubt what the book says, then guess what you have to rely on? You have to rely on your own facts and your own feelings. Well, suppose your facts are not right. Suppose your feelings are incorrect. Suppose you've been up for several days and suppose you're fatigued and really tired and suppose you think that something's uh, the, way that, the way that you see it, but it happens to be your state of mind is not what it ought to be. You know that happens sometimes to people. And then the next thing you know, you're saying things and doing things that you don't do. If you don't have something to guide yourself with, ladies and gentlemen, you're like a ship tossed to and fro and blown around with every wind of doctrine. It's important that you stick to doctrinal things. That doesn't mean you stretch doctrinal things. He says they'll be turned away from the truth and turned unto fables. What? The time will come when they will not endure sound. I showed you this morning. What is it? Doctrine. What is doctrine? It's absolute truth. It's a razor blade. It's absolute. It doesn't change. It doesn't change just because you're in 2024. It stays the same all the way through. You have to learn to, to it's okay to amen that. You say, well, you know, you can't be, yes, you can be absolute. The King James Bible is absolute the authority of the Word of God. Now, I don't care what other people say. You say, well, but preacher, you... no, stop. Now you're putting your intellect there. If God says there's one faith and one baptism and one Holy Spirit and your salvation and you're eternally secure and 350 different translations, something doesn't add up. So you get the problem is, is that we come in and we have the yea hath God society says, yea hath God said society, and they step in and they say, well, I know what it says, but I think what he means. No, 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 he said what he meant. Yes. The problem is, is you have to always err on the side of you're probably wrong. Amen. And you read the Bible and you hit something that doesn't hit you right, don't immediately think that there's a misprint in the Bible. Think that there's a misprint in your heart. There's something wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. And then what happens oftentimes, people say, well, why did God let that happen? And why did God do this? And I think God made a mistake. God never made a mistake. God hadn't made a single mistake, not one time. Although I look in the mirror sometimes and I wonder about that. But nonetheless, I know he doeth all things well. God is a good God. And anything that God does, God does for my benefit, even if it's tell me no. But whenever you put yourself in there and say, well, but there's this thing that's going on in my life and things are a little bit different, be careful. God's cut and dried. There's not a lot of gray. It's black and white. It's up or down. It's not this middle kind of fishy sort of Laodicea the rights of the people and what do the people say and what do the people think. You should realize when people are making merchandise of you, don't you see that in modern churches today? Don't you understand that they have enough sense to know what it is that trips your trigger that will get you to come back time and time and time again? You can hear it in their form of speech. You can hear it in what they do for entertainment. You can hear what they do. So what are they doing? They're after your pocketbook or your wife. They don't talk like preachers anymore. They're teachers. You say, what? Don't be preaching to us. Don't be preaching at us. 
We don't want people preaching at us anymore. Well, in the Bible, everywhere in the Bible, I showed you in the Bible, the Lord is compared to Jeremiah and Elijah. Go pull their sermons and look at them and see how many of those sermons were just to try to pander to the people. All of those sermons were at people. Jesus came at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what you want to remember is, is you have to hold fast to the old time way. Why? It's passing by you. You have to hold and cling to the old paths. You say what? This old man's going to be gone before long. It's going to be in your hands. You have to be able to make a decision if something were to happen and we're never able to gather here again and we're not ever to be there and it's just you and your family. What are you going to stand on? You have to have your own convictions about those things and you have to be willing to do it. This is not a game we're in. This is the most serious thing that there is. That's why when people mess with it, you should take offense to it. As much as somebody kicking your door down and trying to take advantage of one of your kids, somebody trying to take that book out of your lap, that should bother you and it should upset you and it shouldn't be, well, you know, that's just how people... No, uh-uh. That one thing should make your ears turn red. Amen. You say, why? He says to hold fast. He says for you to guard it. He said for you to protect it. He said for you to hold on to it. He said for you to preach it, not teach it. Amen. Preach the word, not animal stories and not theoretical stuff that you see. I watched a little bit of it in the last couple of weeks and stuff. I watched enough of it that I just thought to myself, how does somebody sit there and listen to that? How do they not know that they're getting a sales pitch? How do they listen to the tone of the voice of an individual that calls himself a preacher standing up there with holy jeans on, and I don't mean because they've been splashed with holy water, and a golf shirt with a microphone stuck in their mouth, and every now and then mention a word of scripture or something. How do they stand there and listen to that motivational speaker and not think to themselves, what's that guy doing? He's not helping me eternally. He's telling me things I can do to be beneficial for my life here and now. I've done you no good at all if all I do is make your life better here and now. Amen. Did you hear me? I've done you no good at all. Because it won't last. When you go to a hole in the ground, you are not going to be worth anything. If, well, I had a better life while I was there. I went to 3857 and, man, I mean, you know what? Things got better for me. How did it hit you at the judgment seat? Well, why'd you got to bring that up? Because that's the most important thing in your life. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. What's the point of having camp and having Sunday school and having uh, vacation Bible school and all the stuff that goes with putting all that on? What's the point in having a building and having hundreds of people gathered here and that kind of deal and dealing with all the things that go with that if there's not an eternal significance to it? Amen. You have to learn to hold fast to those yes. things because yes. that's the stuff that actually matters. It's eternal. It's not for the here and now, it's for the hereafter. I look in Hebrews chapter number 3, some things to hold fast to. Look in verse number 6, <coughs> excuse me. Hebrews 3 verse 6, And Christ the Son of His own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. Now the passage applies to an individual that is in the tribulation period and they have a faith and work set up there. And I don't have time to go into all that tonight. But there's a practical application of that. And that practical application is, is that you learn to have confidence in certain things. And certain things you have confidence in, for instance, would be the Apostle Paul, which I'll show you in a little while. When the Apostle Paul says to you, follow me as I follow Christ, you are solidly confident in following Paul while he's following Christ. You can't see Christ, but you can see Paul. He chose to work through Paul. Well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Everybody doesn't get their orders from Jesus. God always used a man to speak through. God uses a father in a household. He uses a husband in a household. He uses a mother to tell children what to do. He uses a boss to tell you what to do. That set of authority is set up everywhere throughout the entire Bible. There's a hierarchy of angels in heaven. There's a hierarchy down in hell. It's everywhere you go. It's not everybody just going to do what Jesus says to do and nobody doing what anybody else says to do. That's demonic. That's not, that's what the devil said. I'm the same as God. And that's what happened. Everything fell down after that. I have confidence in what? I've got confidence in knowing that what Jesus gave me, come to Hebrews 10, what Jesus gave me, I can have confidence in. What did he give me? He gave me a man to follow. He gave you a man to follow. He gave you a man to follow. Who did he give you to follow? The apostle Paul. 
He said, follow him. You know what Paul said to Timothy? Follow me. You know what Paul said to his other preachers? Follow me. How dare Paul say something like that unless God gave him the authority to do that? That's the only way to prevent utter chaos, ladies and gentlemen. There has to be a willingness on your part to realize we all get our orders from somewhere. Everybody's following somebody. But it's a difficult principle for you to practice. And until you understand that principle, you're going to always be struggling against the authority of the will of God in your life. You will never subject yourself to the will of God in your life until you learn to subject yourself to what God would have you do in following other people. He said, but the people that are over me are stupid. And the people that are over me and no more, they don't know anything. They don't know as much as me and so on and so forth. You're already headed for trouble. God said, I gave you an authority. Now, why can't you do what they tell you to do? Some of you younger people, you have a problem doing what your parents and your grandparents say to do. You're, you're, you're smart alecky. When old people try to tell you what to do. You're inconsiderate. You're unkind. You're rebellious. You get running around the halls and somebody calls you down. It's kind of like, who do you think you are to call me down? Who are you to be running in the church house? Yes. And of course, your mom and dad might feel the same way too that you do. But you know what you wind up happening? And then you wind up in the public school system. Let me ask you something. You want your kid and telling their teachers what to do? Will please in Hebrews chapter number 10 and in verse number 23, 10, 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Can I just say this about that? You have to hold fast to that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, your profession of faith. You say, why? The world tries to take it out of you, like around the water cooler. Uh, how many of you, don't, don't raise your hands. I'm not looking for, you know, getting your crowd involved and all that parlor trick stuff. How many of you work uh, at, at work somewhere around a bunch of heathens? You know what'll happen to your testimony? It'll get kind of quiet. What'll happen, you get around the water cooler, you get around nowadays, you get around the coffee pot, you get around the Keurig and all that, and people are there waiting uh, around the Keurig to be able to get their a cup of coffee, and you're standing around, and before long, the lowest common denominator of what's being discussed is something you have no business discussing, let alone hearing. And then before long, the Holy Spirit says to you, hey, you know something? They wouldn't be talking like that around you if they knew where you stood. I mean, aren't you a deacon in the church? Aren't you a Christian? Aren't you a song leader? Aren't you a, a piano player? Aren't you an organ player? Aren't you a Sunday school teacher? Or well, they must not know that. They sure wouldn't be talking like that around, around you. How are they talking that way? You know what happened? You hadn't held fast to your profession. That doesn't mean you have to run through there and, hey, don't be saying that I'm a Christian. You don't have to be a jerk. You know what you can do the next time you hear one of those big uh, foul languages come off and they curse the name of Jesus Christ? Say, oh, I didn't know you knew him. Amen. I know him too. Hey, you want, let's have a word of prayer. You'd be surprised how quick. It looked like they swallowed their tongue. They know when they say that kind of thing. See, what is that? That's just somebody blunder busting. They're just trying to act like they're tough. But you know what will happen? Because you desire to be like one of them before long, your testimony will be shot. Holding fast your profession of faith. When's the last time that you just got... I'm not talking about even giving them a track. I'm talking about just saying, hey, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Thank the Lord I'm not where I used to be. I'm headed to another place now. I mean, you've got all kind of opportunities. All it does is thank, you know, thank the Lord I know where I'm going when I die. And a lady came by yesterday. We're sitting out there and she said, man, I'm lost. I've gone back and forth like this. And my brother says, well, I can show you to Jesus. And he ain't. Well, she said, oh, Lord, no, I got that one down right, you know. And then she kept going, you know, that kind of a deal. And she said, what was that? Well, it's just a little opportunity. Yeah. Just an opportunity. You know, I, I'm lost. Well, I can show you Jesus. You don't have to be lost anymore. Yeah. Oh, well, that's kind of brash. That's a hospital. I mean, you know, that's kind of a crazy. Holding fast the profession. Yeah. The days where you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ, you're not hiding. I remember the old preacher preaching. We were over in, uh, uh, not, what's the place we used to go over there? Um, past Monticello. Anyway, over, over that way, Milton or somewhere there. And we're over there at that big youth camp that we used to go to. And the preacher's over there preaching and Jesus Christ is behind this boy at the locker and he's been beaten up there and he's got his hands tied like this and got a crown of thorns on his head and he's there in a loincloth and all that and blood dripping off of him and that kind of thing. I think the message is all not, a, not ashamed of Jesus. And the boys are all crowded around him there and he's using all kind of illustrations and stuff they're telling him and he keeps putting and Jesus, by the time they get done, Jesus is all the way behind the guy. And he's there right behind the guy, getting ready to get crucified, and he's standing behind the guy, but the guy's ashamed of him. 
I've seen that time and time again. You say, why? You better hold fast to your profession. You say, what? The world will take it away from you. I mean, I got a whole list of things that can take it away from you, but before long, you know what'll happen? You'll be talking like the world, looking like the world, acting like the world, listening like the world, and before long, you know what happens? What goes in your mind, what goes in your heart, what goes in there, eventually it affects who you are as a person. I don't care who you are or how religious and how righteous you think you are, you can't be around pig slop and not smell like pigs. Amen. Eventually, sooner or later, you know what will happen? It will creep into your theology and before long it will erode your doctrine. And then before long it will be kind of like, well, that's kind of a bold witness. And I don't know that we ought to be doing that. Shouldn't stand on a street corner and shouldn't pass out a track. And you shouldn't be public about that. And how embarrassing at a restaurant that you're paying for the food and you're tipping the waitress... How embarrassing to bow your head and pray and ask God to bless the food that's in front of you because, you know, that might be, you better hold fast to that profession. You better be willing to stand up if the Lord gives you an opportunity to stand up and to speak up and to not shut up. Peter's over there in Acts chapter number five there toward the end of that passage there. And when he's coming down to the end of that thing, they say, Peter, you can talk, but you can't keep mentioning Jesus. And he says, mention who? He said, Jesus. And he goes off on a rant about Jesus. And they said, we're warning you, if you keep talking about Jesus, we're going to beat the tar out of you, tar and feather you and hang you out to dry. And Peter said, can't talk about what? And he said about Jesus. And he said, oh, let me tell you. And he starts about Jesus and they hang him up and they beat the tar out of him. And you come to the end of that passage there on that left-hand page, left-hand column. You know what he said? He says to his buddy, ain't it a blessing to take a beating for the right thing? Paul said, you're partakers with me of what? Of the sufferings of Christ. Why? He couldn't keep his mouth shut about his road to Damascus experience. Can I ask you a question? How are you at holding fast to the profession? I'm not talking about in here. I appreciate a good testimony in here. It's a blessing. It's an encouragement. I'm talking about out there among the wolves, among the lions, among the tigers, among the bears, among the gals, among the girls, among the people that you're trying to impress and all that. How's your testimony out there? You better hold fast. I mean, hang on to it tight. You say, why? Somebody's trying to rip it out of your hand, take it out of your heart. You say, what'll happen? Eventually, before long, your mouth will betray you. You don't have to listen long to somebody talk before you know where their heart's at, where their mind's at. I mean, if you go talk to somebody for five minutes and the first thing they get is eight-point buck that they shot or the football team that's winning or who the numbers are or what's going on in the polls and this and that and the other, you can tell. It's not always just wicked, ungodly stuff. You say, what happens? You better hold fast to that profession. You better make it a habit. You say, why? It'll get away from you. When was the last time you witnessed to somebody? When was the last time you just told somebody about Jesus? I mean, listen, this gets pretty real, you know, when somebody gets ready to step over to the other side, you know what you think? I'm glad somebody told them because what? I wouldn't have the comfort I got right now that if something happens while I'm standing here in the pulpit and one of y'all comes up here and say, this one's gone or that one's gone, I can say, well, thank God for what the book said. Somebody told them and they accepted that. These people that Brother Dan's going to see, some of you could care less about them. Doesn't matter. They deserve to be there. Didn't say they don't deserve to be there. They're in a good spot, though, to trust Jesus. And I know you may find it hard to believe, but guess what? They may have to get in there to get out. And they need somebody to be able to tell them about it. You're not trying to turn them into great citizens or relieve them of the responsibility for their criminal acts. You're trying to see a soul saved. And so what's happening? Well, he goes down there and what does he do? I'll guarantee you a portion of his testimony, a portion of his preaching will always contain, let me tell you guys, when I got saved, you say, why? They need to know it's real to you. Just you giving them the Bible rightly divided, ladies and gentlemen, until they recognize it's real to you, that it touches your heart, it made tears come down your face, that it did something for you personal. That's like you going to a doctor and saying, well, he gave me some prescription. Did you take it? Well, no. Well, did it do you any good? Well, I don't know. I I just know they say that it does some good. You know what they want? They want to know it matters to you. Does it matter to you? Do you, do you care? Does it really matter that people are dying and going to hell? Does that make a difference to you? It's not just about living right, doing right, acting right, spitting white, all the kind of things that we equate with Christianity. It's about a testimony. It's about a willingness not to hold, I mean, to not turn loose off, but to hold fast to that profession of faith, to remember where I was when Jesus saved me and kept me from going to hell. 
I like Brother David's testimony this morning. It's short and sweet. But you know what he said? That preacher preached hell so hot, I was afraid I was going to go there and I didn't want to burn and I got saved. Yeah. You say, well, you know, he messed up and this and that and the other. Yeah, but you missed the first part. Hell was so hot, I didn't want to burn, I got saved. Yeah. Everything after that doesn't make a difference. You can say, what happens when you talk to other people? That's what you tell them. Listen, this is what Jesus did for me. The Apostle Paul, and in Acts chapter number 26, he's there before Felix and Agrippa. They have all the who's who and everybody that could be somebody is in those days in that time. They're gathered in that big old Colosseum of people, and he's got thousands of people there, and they're there gathered together to see the Apostle Paul, and they're thinking to themselves, we're going to finally see this big old guy that must be 25 foot tall, and he must be big as a monster, and, and all that kind of stuff. He must be strong as Samson. I mean, we've heard all the havoc and all the trouble and all the stuff he's done and all the stuff he's created. And they get him and here comes this little squinty-eyed, bent-over Jew that's been beaten to within a half inch of his life and he can't half see and somebody has to get him up there where he can see and he knows the law backwards, forwards, and sideways, above the law of blameless, according to Philippians chapter number three. He's trained at the feet of Gamil, the acting Perry Mason of his day, the lawyer of his day, and the Apostle Paul steps up there and of all things the Apostle Paul said is, let me tell you what happened to me on the road to Damascus. Amen. He doesn't quote statutes. He doesn't quote precedent. He doesn't say in the law book it says. He doesn't say I'm a Roman citizen and here's what I have to set before you and I'm hoping you'll find me innocent so that you can set me free and you've done me wrong. He doesn't do any of that. You know what he says? Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Amen. You want to have a great testimony? You better hold to it. What is your testimony? What is the words that come out of your mouth? What do they know you for? You kids, you guys, are, you are grown men that get an opportunity to speak to these kids. You know what they need? You say, well, they got to give them Bible, Bible, Bible. You know what they need? They need to know what God did for you. Yes. They need to know how God used you as a grown man and whether it was in the military or whether it's cutting hair or whether it's a policeman or whether it's a plumber or whether it's cutting grass or whether it's driving a truck or whatever in blazes you do. You know what they need to know? They need to know what does Jesus mean to you. They need to know it's real to you. They need to know it don't matter what you did for a living. It's what did Jesus do for me? And if you're not willing to do that, you ain't going to touch their hearts. Facts don't touch hearts. But other hearts that have been touched touch hearts that need to be touched. Yes. Hold fast that profession. Have you let it slip? In the old days, they put pressure on you all the time. And, you know, they would always tell you about the importance of witnessing and all that kind of stuff because what they were trying to do was to try to build up a kingdom and that kind of thing. Uh, whether somebody comes or doesn't come, it doesn't relieve you of the responsibility of telling others about Jesus Christ. Preacher, how do I do that? Well, that woman at the well did a pretty good job there in John chapter 4. You say, what did she do? She just went back and told the people in the town what Jesus did for her. Amen. She didn't go to a soul winning class. Amen. She didn't have any special new members class. She didn't go down to the Romans Road class. She wasn't given a whole bunch of tracts or anything like that. She didn't have all the answers to all the questions. She hadn't been to any kind of a Bible school. She just knew, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. And he, something about the way she said that turned that entire town out. You say, it can't be that simple. It's absolutely that simple. We've complicated it too much. We've made it way too sophisticated. And they got all worried about this easy believism. Don't worry about easy believism. Just get them over there where you can get them to the trough and give them an opportunity to get a drink. You say, why? They're dying of thirst out there. Don't get into a doctrinal dissertation with them and some kind of an argument with them over whether or not who, how many angels dance on the head of a pen or who's making umbrellas for the millennial reign. Just tell them of what Jesus did for you. You want to tell you how to get a backslider? Tell when you were backslid and what Jesus did for you when you got back in fellowship. You don't give them the details of it. I've been where you are. I've been in that ditch. Dump down in the ditch there with them and say, I've been down in here and I know how to get out. How do I, how do I get out? How do you get out? You get out on your knees and ask God to get you out. You get out on your, yeah, you get out on your knees. The way up is down, man. I've been right here before. I've done what you've done. There is nothing you can do. He won't forgive you. All. Now let's get out here and pray together. You'd be surprised how quick they'll come back up. We have all kind of people here. I wouldn't allow them to do it. We have all kind of people here that have been in that ditch. 
We have all kind of people here that you see them on the outside. They're shined up and polished up now. They look pretty good now. But boy, if you look back just a couple of years in their life, they were down in a ditch somewhere and had a bunch of hog dewy on them. And I mean, they stunk to high heaven and were doing stuff they had no business doing, questioned their own salvation, weren't even sure where they were. And now they're sitting in church, a Bible believer, King James only, and believe that they're going home to heaven. You say, what? They're sitting in church, some of them right next to you, and you don't even know it. Amen. You say, why? Wow, Jesus did something for them. Amen. What's Jesus done for you lately? You breathing air? Whose air is that you're breathing? Whose air are you breathing right now? How much would you pay for that air? You don't have to pay a dime. It's free for everybody. It's like salvation. If you can breathe it, you can get it. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? I mean, you know, you can't last more than three or four minutes without air. Most of us can do without food for at least 40 days or so. It help us in the middle anyway. Most of us look like a fence around a chicken graveyard. Our belt does anyway. I'm pausing to catch my breath there. <laughs> but, but ladies and gentlemen, when's the last time you just simply told somebody what Jesus is? to just hear somebody walk up to you out of the blue in the grocery store and say, hey man, can I just tell you what Jesus did for me? And as soon as you've got yourself off the floor, they call rescue and give you some smelling salts and stuff like that. Wait a minute, man, I want to hear this guy's story. Uh, I thought he was going to talk about the hypocrites in the church. I thought he was going to talk about all the people that weren't doing what they thought they ought to be doing. What do you waste your breath on? Amen. You waste your breath making fun of the preachers? You make your, waste your breath on making fun of other Christians that don't have it down pat? I admire the work that went into what these young'uns were up here doing. I call them young'uns. I'm old now, so I can do that. And you say, well, they get offended by it. That's my problem. That's not your problem. Don't, don't be offended for me, okay? If they get offended, they can come to me and say, don't be calling me a young'un. <laughs> and then I'm going to go, young'un, 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 young'un. <laughs> But, I, but, I, but, but that takes practice yes. to do something like that. And then to marry that thing together, to have that that way. You say, what is that? You know what you're getting a blessing? You're getting a blessing off the sweat that they put in there to take the time to practice. You hear these people get up here and they sing and stuff like that. You say, what do they do? They practice. You don't get that kind of a thing. That's ministry. You're, minister, you're getting ministered to because of sweat. That's not somebody entertaining you. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you considered your profession? Your profession of faith in Him? And the last time you just got an opportunity to stand up and say, I want to thank Jesus Christ for saving my soul when I was seven years of age. I was by a dining room table in a place in Miami, Florida, and Jesus Christ saved my soul. Thank you. Amen. You say, what is that? Hold fast to that profession. Hang on to it. world wants it. They want you to profess anything but Jesus. The religious world wants it. Yep. Profess anything but the Bible. The devil wants it. He'd love to destroy it. You say, what is it? Just, just the simplicity of the, of, I never get tired of hearing a preacher get up and give his testimony. Well, you know, my name's Bobby Cole Lutley. And I was down there. What I did is I came to Lang Street Baptist Church and I came down there to the front right there. And I said, my name's Bobby Cole Lutley and I'm going to hell sure as I'm standing here. If I don't get saved. And he got saved. He went out there and he got out into his card and he said, it sounded, the birds sounded different and the flowers sounded different like that. And I looked up there and there was a little girl up there in a hula skirt dancing around on my dash. And I grabbed that thing and threw it out the window and said, you ain't dancing in my car no more. Amen. You Amen. say, why do you know that? I bet you I've heard that thing a hundred times. Yeah. You right. say what? From an 80 something year old preacher, faithful preaching and pastor in his church for over 50 years. Holding his profession. I think of that old man. I think how many times that old preacher on a regular basis, he would get up there and preach into all those prisoners and stuff up there and talk about it 27 years of age and being out there in a caribou hole out there on the backside of nowhere and asking God where he was and all that and reading the stolen Bible and losing about five pounds. And then he winds up going out there to a church service and uh, Brother Powell was out there after he ran into him at the record room and he ran in the record room and he saw the preacher there and he said, uh, hey man, what do you know? He said, I know Jesus Christ. What do you know. And he said, he took out a Bible just like that. And he turned that Bible and he showed me I was a sinner. He said, you believe that? You believe that? You believe that? He said, you ain't no liar. Are you? He said, no, no, I ain't no liar. I ain't no liar. I said, okay. Well, the Bible says, and so he trusted the Lord. And he said, now read this right here in 1 John 5, 13, that you may know that you're saved. He said, well, is that what it says? He said, well, this is what it says. He said, you think God's a liar? No, I don't think he's a liar. He said, how do, how do you know that? I bet you I've heard that thing a hundred times. You say, why? Holding fast to his profession. How many times people heard your profession? 
Do they even know you're saved? You know why? You got to turn around and get on to me. I'm not getting on to you. This is the greatest thing ever happened to me, man. I mean, getting married was a blast. I appreciate that. It's been a good, good ride. I mean, I appreciate it. I really do. Some of the stuff I've experienced in life, but compared to being saved and not burning forever. Amen. Are you kidding me? But it's quick to talk about, well, what I did here and what I did here and experience there and a the trip we took there and where we went over here and where we, what about your profession? What does your mouth get full of? You ever have your mouth get full of gravel because all you do is always talk about anything but your profession? I've learned this. I've learned if I hold fast to that profession, then I'm less likely for the wrong kind of things to come out of my mouth. Yeah. That's right. yeah. I don't have it down pat. Can I just give you one more? It's later than I thought it was. I'm going to run over here to the hospital in just a minute here. Look, if you will, please, at uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Let's talk about holding fast. This says, take fast, hold. Proverbs chapter 4, uh, look in verse number 13. Instead of hold fast, this says, take fast, hold of what? Instruction. Of what? Instruction. Does that make you uncomfortable? Instruction. You say, Why? There must be something to it. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep taketh away, uh, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness, and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is a shining light, and shineth more and more in the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not what they stumble. My son, attend to my W-O-R-D. Yes, isn't that where we started? Hold fast to that which is good. Hold fast to the words of God. You know what he said? You better hold on to my words. Why? Their life. He'll finish that passage up with keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. You say, what is that? That's instruction he's given. Who's that instruction coming from? Oh, just the wisest man in all the earth. Just Solomon. Just somebody that was David's son. Just somebody that God chose to bless and God chose to use and God chose to make wiser than he made anybody else. Just a little old fellow named Solomon, considered to be the wisest man in all the earth. You know what he said? You better be willing to listen to instruction. Are you willing to listen to instruction? You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's an odd, strange, unusual thing that takes place in all the classes and all the other kind of things. I heard an old FBI agent tell me this one time before. His name was Booth. He was a real good firearms instructor. He could knock the pee off a post at 300 yards with a two-inch pistol. I mean, he, was, he was like he should have been in a circus or something. He was so good at what he did. He knew it backwards, forward, sideways, upside down. You could blindfold. I mean, it was phenomenal what he could do with mirrors and turning things around and, and doing all kind of things like that. And so I walked up to him one day and I was just talking to him and asking him some questions. And I said, what do you think the secret to all your success is? And he said, I learned to listen to my instructors. Now, see, you don't think that's much of anything. But he said, one of my first instructors told me that I had a problem. And I said, okay, well, what did he tell you? Was it because your trigger squeeze was off or because you did that? He said, no, you know what he told me? He told me I was unteachable. And I said, he told you you were unteachable. He said, yeah, he told me he was unteachable and walked off and said, I'm not spending any more time with you because you think you know everything. You're unwilling to learn. See, ladies and gentlemen, it's one thing to receive instruction. It's another thing to look in the mirror and find out, am I teachable? Can God spend time with me and show me something? Can he show you something from somebody that you think you're smarter than? And a hush fell across the crowd. It's not a matter of whether or not you're a good instructor. It's a matter of whether or not are you teachable? Can you learn anything? You say, well, preacher, you know, I, I just kind of think that, well, okay, there's the problem. You'd be surprised how you can learn lessons. And what that Bible teaches you, he'll say sometimes out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. You have ever a little kid teach you something or an animal teach you something that you didn't see before and you look at that little kid and you think, how'd he know that? And the Lord said, I've tried to teach you that 10 times, but that kid's got enough sense to listen to me. Are you teachable? Can you do what God tells you to do? I don't always like what God tells me to do. You're a fool if you think so. My flesh fights against it just like yours does. It's a battle of wills oftentimes. Maybe you've never been in a position where God asks you to do something and you're thinking to yourself, well, Lord, I'd just rather not do that. 
And the Lord said, well, it's what I want you to do. Well, okay, but I'd like for you to do it. Well, I don't want to do it. Well, you're an unteachable brat. What nugget you think he's going to give me if I won't submit myself to his word? So, oh, well, I always submit. Really? Amen. I'll run some verses for you in the next few weeks and we'll find out if you're there. You know what I found out? I found out a lot of times my lack of growth in my Christian life was because I was unteachable. I'd already made my mind up. Right. Yes. Right. Yes, sir. And God said, I'm ready to change directions here. Yes. You never quit learning until you become unteachable. And then nobody can teach you anything. And you're in a dangerous spot. You say, well, who's like that? Satan. Amen. You couldn't convince him with a convincing machine that he's wrong. Sorry to end it on such a negative note there, ladies and gentlemen. But you know what he said? He said, you have to keep instruction. Well, what's instruction? Somebody telling you what to do. Well, who likes that? Unless you're the boss. And then everybody better do it. There's a guy that I know, he lives, well, I won't even say where he lives. There's a, in, in the United States, I'll say that. I can safely say that without creating, because uh, I know what some of you are going to do. I wonder who he's talking about. I wonder who he's talking about. Oh, he's just making it up and all that kind of thing. Okay, there's a guy that I know, and he's, he's real big on this, uh, 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 this uh, submission, this subjection, this thing. And the thing is, is that... He only means when he's the one giving the orders. And he doesn't believe that you should do what anybody tells you to do unless he's the one telling you to do it, including against the government and against moms and dads and against any authority, even in schools, teachers and all that. You have a right to be heard. And he teaches that. But you better not buck him. Now, I'll just ask you a question. We'll leave with this. Are you able to be instructed? So not me. Have you ever been hungry? If you've been hungry, you know what you'll do? You'll let your boss tell you what to do so you can get a paycheck so you can put food on the table. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. You know what I don't want to do? I don't want to get sideways with him where when he says, you're going to sit down and listen to this guy. And whether you like it or not, you're going to do what he tells you to do. Because in so doing, you're doing what I'm telling you to do. I don't ever want to get where I'm unteachable. Do you? That instruction comes. Well, why would he give it to me if I don't need it? Or give that to somebody that needs it. I am. Well, Lord, I got all these other things down pat. But you don't have that down pat. Are you teachable? Are you pliable? A friend of mine told me a couple of days ago some pretty rough things happened to him and all that. And he said, preacher, he said, I don't want to take myself off the wheel. I said, what do you mean? He said, I feel like the Lord's been working on me and molding me and making me and shaping me. And I don't want to do anything crazy or stupid here. But he said, I... I kind of feel like, I said, take yourself off the wheel. And he goes, well, I feel like the Lord's using this to work on me. I said, then stay on the wheel. Right. If God's doing it, he'll shape you into what he wants you to be. I just hate when I want to be a pitcher and he turns me into a plate. Because he has to mash me down. And the Lord, I thought I was going to be a pitcher. I know you thought you were going to be a pitcher but I need a plate right now. Right. Now, do you want to be a plate? The Lord, pictures are so much nicer to look like, look at. And they don't get scraped and have a bunch of food dumped on them and get washed and put up and all that other kind of stuff. I mean, it looks so pretty up there in the cabinet. The Lord said, I need a plate. Okay, Lord, I want to be a plate. Mash you flatter than a pancake. Thank you, Lord. It's wonderful to be a plate. Heavenly Father, I pray you bless your word. We thank you for your many blessings and pray that you...